Okay, um, my clock is hitting five o'clock, and I'm sure most of yours would also be. Uh, so let me begin uh, on today's session. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome all the students uh, from our new batch at Postima uh, to day six of our series of um, uh, our series of uh, knowledge sessions. Um, these sessions are designed to involve you, to motivate you, and even further to excite you into your new chosen field of business management. Uh, business management is a huge area, and there are a lot of specializations. But uh, in these uh, knowledge sessions, we are hearing from the experts, uh, people who have succeeded and people, and people who are the best uh, in the field. So, um, without uh, uh, our best uh, in the field. So, um, without, uh, so, I would like to introduce today Mr. Raj Nair. Uh, Raj, just say hello. You're on the big screen. Okay. Um, so, uh, Raj Nair is um, actually, uh, um, has, I have uh, a relationship with Raj at really many different levels. He is uh, certainly first a friend because we we are from the same batch from I am and the and the bad, and uh, since then we have maintained on and off uh, contact and communication through our various uh, uh, networking that we have within our group, uh, and we have maintained that relationship for well over forty five years. Uh, and I have seen Raj really go really go from strength to strength, uh, from being just one from being just one of the many people who take up good jobs uh, and also really to uh, become the top of his uh, trade or his speciality. And I, I uh, being from the same batch, I am uh, very proud of that, in fact, to be associated with him. So besides a friend, he has been a colleague uh, because he has been in industry and business. And uh, today, uh, his third is really he's a distinguished management professional, uh, second to none. Um, so uh, we, uh, I will just go very briefly in terms of Raj's background. I'm sure you must have read it in terms of what we have distributed. Uh, Raj, of course, started uh, uh, on, on the twin uh, uh, sort of twin badges of uh, both from IIT Bombay and IIT Ahmedabad. And like many of us, he's, he started his uh, sort of career uh, with uh, to banking, uh, commercial banking, uh, and uh, and sort of continued uh, at, at many different uh, sort of levels. And then uh, he, his big stop, uh, step, giant step was really to found and start Avalon Consulting. And uh, Avalon Consulting has been there um, for over two decades. Uh, it is uh, a consultant uh, which is very well known in the industry. Uh, its focus area has been strategy, analytics, and business transformation. These are high sounding words, and, uh, and, and certainly consulting is one area unless you are the very top and the very best and you're really at the cutting edge, you will not continue, really. So for Raj to have continued on this amazing journey is really fantastic. Um, the real test of, uh, I would say, a prowess of of, uh, of someone in uh, of a business manager is really uh, how much he can predict or how much he can see or feel uh, how things are going, both in terms of the environment, in terms of business, and in terms of the industry. So um, uh, Raj Nair has had a distinctive uh, sort of position in that his company, Avalon Consulting, uh, which operates both in India and abroad, comes out with an annual forecast for business and industry. Uh, and we, all of us, and a lot of people in industry really uh, read this. And uh, he has made, he has not hesitated to make startling predictions. And many of them have come out uh, really right on top. In particular, uh, the 2008 uh, 
uh, uh, right financial global financial crisis. He was right at the beginning, able to predict that uh, uh, things will happen, and he pred correctly predicted the oil price crash uh, from $140. Uh, uh, and this was uh, even Goldman Sachs was unable to predict this. So you can see that uh, Raj has a particular sort of uh, feel for business. And uh, more recently, um, he has also uh, predict predicted uh, his most recent annual uh, uh, noting. Uh, his uh, annual review has been the tipping point. And in this, he has predicted huge changes uh, that the world will expect in this uh, particular year. Uh, so these changes are, of course, uh, business related, and we can see that a lot of these changes are happening. And it's not just the coronavirus I'm talking about, but really changes in business and the way we do business. I hope uh, Raj he does touch on many of uh, these things. Um, I would like to mention, and this is quite an honor, uh, that he has been awarded a distinguished luminous award. Uh, by his alma mater, uh, IIT Bombay, uh, in 2016. Uh, I hope uh, and for to be called uh, sort of 40 years down after graduating and being conferred an honor by your own alma mater, again, uh, I, I think you must have achieved something. Perhaps if you can share uh, how exactly this came about, that would be of great interest to many of us. Uh, for today's topic, is something closer to all of you. Um, and uh, it is the magic word uh, uh, called uh, how to succeed really uh, in business. And uh, there's no other person perhaps more competent uh, than him to speak on the top topic of what it takes to succeed. OK, before I give the mic over to Raj, uh, I would like to mention that Avalon Consulting uh, continues to be a very dynamic company and it continues to be a high value recruiter uh, in India from business schools. Okay, um, with that, let's move over to Raj. Uh, so, Raj, uh, your, your cup of tea now. I'd like to say hi to all my young friends and the respected faculty members who are attending the session and the organizers too. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak to young people. This is a very difficult time in India's history. Uh, as, we, as Vinod said, uh, uh, Professor Call said a few minutes ago, this was not unexpected. From 2018, I've been saying that within a few years, we're going to have a major crisis. And it all it takes is a little trigger. And there are reasons for it. I can, if you ask me a question later, I can answer that. Because today I don't want to talk about that <clears throat> um, in my main main talk. And I'm happy to take questions on that, why I expected it to be happening. I didn't know what the trigger was, but in January or end of December, early January, when I started writing the paper for this year, I said, oh my God, the thing that I was expecting is going to happen this year. So I divided it into two parts. The first part was tipping point one. I normally write just one note. This time I wrote a note in January for tipping point one, which was all about what the government of India has to do to prevent India from being weak when there's a problem. The government didn't do any of those things. Of course, that's a separate matter. And I'd say that I'll write a second paper on tipping point two in February because I, I would get one month more of data to be more precise in my prediction. So the Jan in the February uh, paper for tipping point two, I explained what is going to happen to the world. But let's leave what happened to the world. And many of you will be very worried. Oh my God, what am I going to do when I pass out from this, when I graduate from this from boss time on? Let me assure you that this is the best time to go and join a university, enroll at a university for higher studies. Historically, that's been the case. Whenever there's a major economic crisis, good students decide to do a master's to specialize. 
And this is the time when even the US MBA programs are, are getting full. That's because the professors are then able to give them guidance and bring in new knowledge about how to deal with the post-crisis world. For instance, those who were graduated from any business school in 2018 or 2019 have missed the opportunity to learn about what to do to succeed after 2021 or 2022. So you're lucky in that sense. Uh, you might say that, okay, I'm not studying at IIM Ahmedabad. That's okay. You're doing the next best thing that's possible because at Fostema, you got the special honor of being taught by top class professors who have studied and graduated from IIM Ahmedabad and have gone out into the business world and proven themselves. And they bring to you a combination of theory as well as practice. And so you're in a lucky position at this lucky time in the uh, in the history of the country from students' point of view. From the business point of view, there's a very bad time, okay? So what I'd like you to do is chase the faculty over the next, while you're here doing this course, extract as much knowledge as possible. Ask them hundreds of questions. They'll be only too willing to answer. And so be like a sponge. That's what you should be doing the next two years. Or if you're in the second year, the next one year. I understand from Professor Anil Somani that all of you are from good middle class homes from different cities in India. You're the children of government officers, officials, families that operate small businesses, etc. The fact that you're not children of big industrialists and not children of senior members of large private sector organizations is, I consider, to be a good thing. The reason is you have a great need to succeed. Whereas those who have it laid out are likely to take this easy. Therefore, you're more likely to succeed when the difficult times are over. So even when we recruit, we look for that one element, not just knowledge. We look for an element of, say, is there a real need for this candidate to succeed? Because we feel if there's really no desperate need for that candidate to succeed, he or she is not going to contribute enough to our company. He's not going to work, walk that extra mile to succeed. Therefore, we we'll take people who have that extra need or what in management parlance is called nervous energy. They don't take things for granted. So you are likely to earn success. You won't wait for it to land on your lap because these days nothing is going to land on your lap. Uh, now the question is whether you'll succeed. I, I want to talk about success because you've got competent, very competent uh, professors who are going to teach you all the knowledge that you require. But I want to concentrate on things which are not going to be taught, which life teaches you. And when you combine that with the kind of knowledge that will be imparted by professors at Fostheimer, you'll be well-rounded and ready to succeed. So I'm saying never ask a question, can I succeed? It usually ends up with an answer you may not. However, the mantra is, what does it take to succeed? Whether you're working on a project or whether you're working, trying to decide whether you, you want to succeed, ask yourself, what does it take to succeed? Because the answer will be, it'll, I have to do A, B, C, D. They're actionable. And then if you say, okay, the next round of questions you ask yourself is, what does it take to do A? What does it take to D, do B? And what does it take to C, do C? And you'll get a set of one, two, three, four, five for each of them. Most problems in the world can be solved at asking this question, what does it take at three levels? I've tried it all my life and it's worked. Because every problem can be answered if you can ask yourself this question, what does it take? Not can it. So if you ask yourself, what does it take to succeed, you're going to be able to succeed like nothing ever. Is that audible? Am I audible? Yes, audible. you're yes, audible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. <clears throat> so 
if this was a conventional classroom and if systems were working extremely well, I would have asked each of you this question and tried to ask you what are your A, B, C? What do you think are the steps you require? But since this is not going to a classroom where I can interact with you face to face, I'm going to tell you a series of stories. A series of stories of people who have succeeded. And I'd like you to, all of you to have a piece of paper with you, a pen. And as I tell you each story, you write down why that person succeeded. Just one word each. You know, for instance, hard work or this or that. Just make down a list of few words that will describe why that person succeeded. Okay? So I'm going to tell you six stories or seven stories or whatever. First is from my own personal experience. I met a gentleman who was born in a very small fishing village. A very small fishing village. This child was small, not good looking at all. Not as good looking as any one of you in this class. I've not seen you, but I can assure you, you're not as good looking as you. Had no personality. And the most success and was very poor. He was barely able to go to school, but his father was keen that he goes to school. He, the most successful person in his village, was his uncle who had a pan beauty shop. Not really a pan beauty shop, but a grocery shop selling toothpaste and this and that. So normally one would have expected such a person to have the ambition to become a shop assistant in his uncle's shop and probably open another shop nearby. Instead, he decided that when he has taught science, he felt so fascinated by the new things that he was learning, which nobody in his house could understand or knew, that he got so absorbed in mathematics and science and so forth, he kept on learning and he said, look, this is my chance, this is fantastic, this teacher is teaching me wonderful things. And the teachers also saw the interest that he took and took a special effort to make him understand more than what is required. Now this guy, I'll cut the long story short, and now he works for an Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO. And he's performed so well because of hard work that he's put in charge of launching a very special rocket. On the launch day, Satish Dhawan, Professor Satish Dhawan was the head. He came down to Trivandrum, uh, was in the control room. Rocket went up as it was expected to. But soon after it went up, it took a U-turn and plunged into the sea. This young man was totally dejected and he felt like a total failure. First time he has failed so badly. He wrote out his resignation and gave it to Professor Satish Dhawan. Satish Dhawan just tore it out and told him, look, if there is one person in the whole of ISRO who can send a rocket of the sky up to its target, it's only you. So go back, find out what went wrong. Don't ever make the same mistake again. Many years later, when he told I met him, uh, he told me one thing he learned in life was never make the same mistake again. And he made sure that he never made the same mistake again. Now, cut, cut the story short again. And now I, have, I meet him in Delhi many, many years later. He is now defense advisor to the prime minister. The same village boy whose biggest achievement could have been becoming a shop assistant. Now he's defense advisor to the government of India. Now he was called, I was called for a meeting to, uh, with him because I was working along with my colleagues on a very important strategic project re which relates to performance materials, which would be very important for India in the years to come, and to know which materials to mine, which materials to process, and so on and so forth, what to do with it. I can't go into more detail because it's a very confidential project done 20 years ago. Or 15 years ago. Now, um, they said that we want you to have, be mentored, the team to be mentored by this gentleman who is now the defense advisor to the prime minister. So went and met him. Uh, I was there 10 minutes early as usual. And exactly at 12, his PA came and offered me a gold spot and came with some biscuits and said, you know, uh, Dr. Kalam is busy in a meeting. And Please excuse him. He'll come in 15 minutes. 
Exactly five minutes later, a short gentleman comes coming comes quickly up and looks here and there and says, "Who is Raj Nair?" I said, I. and he said, "I'm so sorry, I kept you waiting. My meeting with you was twelve o'clock. It's five past twelve. I'm extremely embarrassed and I'm sorry." And he called his PA. Have you offered him something to drink? He said, "I said I've had gold spot." And he said, "You know, my customers are inside with me." Customers being the chief of army staff, chief of naval staff, and chief of air force, and we are discussing something. I can't tell them to leave. Please give me five minutes more. But two minutes later, he came back and said, "Come, let me go inside." We went and sat, and I explained the project to him. And he said, "Raj, I can't understand what you said. It's a bit complicated. It's not in my field." And he repeated it. I couldn't imagine such a great man telling me I didn't understand, and he explained the science behind it. And he said, "Ah, now I get it." He said, "You know one thing? We'll meet every month, although we are supposed to meet every two months. We'll meet every month so I can learn something from you." This great man tells me he's going to learn from me, and he does it. Then it was almost lunch time, and he said, "Do uh, you yeah, mind having lunch with me?" I said no problem. I was just thinking that I was thinking of going back to the Taj Palace and having a lovely lunch. But then, okay, let me have lunch with him. So he goes to his desk and pulls out a small aluminium dabba with two clips on one side, one clip on the other side. Opens it and puts two dosas each on our plates. And he says, "See this dosas? I make myself. I always cook my own food. We eat our lunch." During lunch, he asked me, "What other meetings you have today?" I said, "I don't have any other meetings. I've come only to meet you." He says, you know what? Can you wait till three thirty? A head clerk in our defense ministry is retiring today, and there's a farewell function at three thirty. Can you speak a few words? Because if you speak a few words, he'll remember all his life. He'll think that somebody important. Oh, yeah. Hello. Yes, Simon. Tell me whether it's audible. Yes, Just do this. Yes. Abhinav. Okay. And any time it's not audible, do this. I will not. I will not think they're making fun of me. And if it's audible, say this. Okay. So now he says he's caring about. He's the defense advisor <clears throat> about the secretary of the defense ministry, and he's saying that he wants to see that somebody who a head clerk retiring after thirty years is made happy. I put was surprised, and I said, "Okay, I'll do that." And he told his PA to uh, take me to the library and give me all the books to read I wanted, etc. Three thirty, I spoke and went, but it left a lasting impression. This man's humility, the ability to work hard, and so on and so forth. I'm not surprised that he became the president of India. I'm not surprised that he became the most popular president of India and the most meaningful things he did in his life. Uh, I hope you jotted down some of the things about him, which. You think could have contributed to his becoming so successful. Uh, the second story I want to tell you is of a classmate of mine. Again, I'm telling you from experience, not from textbook stuff. This guy was born in a poor family to a retired schoolmaster in a village in South India, in Karnataka, not the main city. The deal in their house was that all the seven children could go to school and go to the next standard, provided they got a scholarship to go to the next class. So, as you would expect, six of the children dropped out at different stages in the schooling, and this chap, because he was always topping the class, he went up and up. He knew that unless he worked very hard, he wouldn't get a scholarship, and if he didn't get scholarship, he wouldn't go to school to the next class. So he went. By working hard all the way up to the standard eleventh, in those days eleventh was thing did PUC and the pre university stood first in Karnataka. He also luckily got into admission, got into IIT Madras. Now, what he told me was that for the first four days he could not understand anything that the professors talked, because he does he did schooling in Karnataka in Canada, and he did not know a word of English. Now he's not the type who'll accept defeat easily, because if he had to accept defeat, he would have not even reached uh, the SSC. So what he did is he went to the library and explained his problem to the librarian, and the librarian said, 
what do you want? He said, I want a dictionary which I keep for a year in my room. He said, nobody asked for a dictionary, take it. And he said, I want different novels to read and it'll take a little time to read them. He said, take it, take. So for the first year, every night after everybody went to sleep, he would read a log, uh, line, pick up the three, four words he didn't understand and try to learn the meaning. And he'd go page by page in a novel. And he would keenly listen to other students who spoke English to understand the pronunciation. Now, when I met him at IM Ahmedabad, he would speak English as well as any convent educated boy. His grammar was good, his vocabulary was superb. So even some of the IIMites who are professors will not be able to guess yet who this person is because he spoke beautiful English. He graduated from there and uh, took up a job and so on. So but let's cut to where he is today. He's a successful businessman in the US. He sold his business four years ago for a few hundred million dollars. He's super rich. That company did badly. So he went and bought back the company at a much lower price and again is rebuilding the company. Every stage of his life was a challenge. At every stage of his life, he overcame the challenge. For him, his goal was clear. When he was a child, he wanted to go to the US and work there. So all through for him, US and be successful. He never had money. He wanted his children to have a lot of money and get the best of education, which he's able to do. Okay. I hope you've also noticed that knowledge, the determination, the humility, and so on and so forth. But Please note down these points. I'm going to come back to these things. The third is the person I've not met. The third is the person, a very famous person now, who died, who uh, was born like all of us, but at the age of six caught polio and triple pneumonia and became lame. You've seen polio patients who can't walk. Her leg was twisted and she used to stand at the window and look at other children playing. So one day, her mother saw her standing at the window and weeping, tears rolling down her cheek. So mother asked her, why are you crying, Wilma? And Wilma said, I want to be like those children who are playing and not sit here. I'm wearing, she was wearing calipers, metal calipers, and had two crutches to walk. I want to be able to play. So her mother said, Wilma, if you really, really want to walk and play, you can do it. She took it seriously. And these are all true stories. None of them is what I'm going to tell you is made up. Next year onwards, she started trying to walk. But she didn't try to walk with crutches. She dropped her crutches and said, let me try and walk without crutches on my calipers. Obviously, after two feet, she fell. And she did this several days in a row and that year at the annual school athletics meet she wanted to take part everybody was shocked she stood in the line with other athletes she ran five steps and fell down and everybody booed and laughed because you know at that age children are cruel very cruel and she cried she got up but she took part she practiced every day after that to try and run every day and will you believe it, by the time she was in senior secondary, she was the school athletics champion. A polio student whose leg was twisted was made straight because the parents invested in straight neck. She was one of 20 children, extremely poor, not a rich person who could take the child to a hospital and get the best doctors to do surgery. Willpower her parents and her willpower, she, her leg became straight. She became the school athletics champion. In the U.S. universities, there are scouts, sports, sports scouts. So one of them was Ed Temple, who was the athletics coach of, of Tennessee University, Tennessee State University. He heard about her and went and watched her quietly practicing every day and went up to her mother and said, you know what, when she finishes school next year, I will get her a sports scholarship in the State University of Tennessee on the strength of her performance in athletics. So that's what happened. She joined the State University of Tennessee and under Ed Temple, a famous coach, 
he put his heart and soul because she put her heart and soul in becoming a runner. Two years later, she was the United States of America's Olympic team. I don't think she did very well in the first Olympics, but the second Olympics when she was there, she was determined to become a gold medalist. And there was a, a, a runner in the 100 meters, a German runner, I think her name was Heide something, Heide something, who was never beaten in any meet ever, not this Olympics. On that fateful day, she lost, she came second to Wilma Rudolph. Wilma Rudolph not only won a gold medal at the Olympics, she won three gold medalists. She became the very first athlete to get three gold medals in a single Olympics. So just see, a person who had calipers, who needed crutches to walk, who could only look at children playing, goes on and before she's 20, becomes the world athletic champions, wins three gold medalists at an Olympic meet. What's your problem? Does anybody have a problem of that kind? Okay, let me also talk about the fourth story. The fourth story is about my childhood hero. You know, all my life I've read biographies of people. They've always inspired me to be better and to be persistent and patient. So Douglas Bader, now most people wouldn't have heard of Douglas Bader. In the 50s and 60s, Every single English child, boy, wanted to become a Douglas Bader. Like every Indian child wants to become a Tindulkar and now probably Kohli. Every single English child wanted to become Douglas Bader. Why did, what was special about Douglas Bader? He was a brave guy. He was gutsy. He did all kinds of things. There's a very good book called Have um, Reach for the Skies. It's a, it's a biography of Douglas Bader reach for the sky. Now, he joins the Air Force. You know, somebody who's got this kind of guts and determination, you want to become a great Air Force fighter pilot. Right from childhood, you want to become a fighter pilot. That was his goal. Somebody wants to become a great teacher. Somebody wants to become, uh, whatever, a rocket scientist. Here, and somebody wants to become a great athlete. And here, somebody wants to become a fighter pilot. So, he used to do all kinds of acrobatic with fighter planes. And once, when he was 21 years old, I think he flew under a bridge and crashed because somebody had challenged him. And when they had to extricate him, they had to cut off both his knees. So he came out, hands and legs, hands and body, no knees, and below. He was hospitalized, treated, surgery was done. They had to cut off whatever was left. And soon he was given thin legs. They, don't have, they didn't have sophisticated plastic legs that you have today. Thin legs, all over 10 legs. Uh, the first day, they made him walk 30 feet. 30 feet. And he struggled, and his, uh, the stump, the two stumps of the leg, they bled. That night, something strange happened. When the nurse came round the ward at 10, 9 o'clock at night to switch off all the lights, they found that bed empty. And there was panic. They searched the whole hospital, they couldn't find it. Douglas Bader. They stepped out and found his car was missing. So they sent police, went all over town to look for him, and they found him driving a car. What he did was he used the two crutches for the brake and the accelerator, and his hand was more than sufficient for navigating. And he had driven around because he was determined. He says, I'm not going to lie down. He lost his job, obviously, because you can't have a pilot even with bad eyesight. Forget having a pilot without legs. Now, a few years later, Second World War happened. England got jacked, badly hammered by Germany. At one point in time, it looked like Germany would conquer England. Their planes were all knocked out, their people were, uh, the pilots were killed, soldiers were dying left, right, and center. And every day, London was being bombed by the Germans. In that situation, there was a frantic call by Winston Churchill. All young men and ex and uh, former pilots, please come back and enroll because we need you to save your motherland. He goes there to enroll and the and, uh, instructor who was to test him laughed at him. He says, look, are you dreaming? He says, look, you know what? You think of any maneuver on a fighter plane, I'll do it better than you. If I do it better than you, will you take me back? 
And that's what he did. He flew many sorties and beat the did it better than the instructor. The instructor took to his word and gave him an excellent grade. And the selection panel had no choice but to select him. Now, Douglas Bader is remembered for having shot down the maximum number of German planes in World War II, just as Indulkar has scored the highest number of runs in cricket. That is why he's famous. But as luck would have it, he was shot down and um, it was the German soldiers found him in a field. They found the wreckage and when they saw the person inside and saw the label, the name on his label, Douglas Bader they said, oh my God, this is the guy who's the pain for all, all, all of Germany. The whole of Germany knew the name of Douglas Bader and we have shot him. Great. And then when they pulled him out, they saw that he had no legs and his two artificial limbs came off. And they were so shocked. They said, look, here's a man we admire. So instead of giving him a lot of beating and this thing, they looked after him well and made sure that he was handed back to England as a prisoner of war. Because he said, we respect somebody who is so great. So that's why he was, became so great. And his history of England, the Royal Air Force has never had a person like him. No legs, no job. And he becomes the greatest fighter pilot who shot the highest number of planes in the world. Is there something that prevents any of you from greatness? I don't think so. It's only in your mind. Let's go back to now to somebody who lived, who lived in Delhi. His name is Mahashay Dharampal Gulati. Do you know who he is? Does anyone know? Just put your hand up and uh, tell me. Yes, sir. Uh, no. MDH CEO. MDH, yeah. Very good. I'm glad you know him. Uh, it's very important to know some people like this. This gentleman uh, was about 25 years old when the partition happened and he moved to India. Before the partition, he tried various things. He was interested in art and drawing and this and that, but not in studies. He did very badly. And his father gave him a job in the spice shop. When he came back across the border, he spent a few days in Amritsar and then came to Delhi and lived with his aunt in a very, very poor locality of Delhi, which didn't, even the houses didn't have toilets. Uh, with little money that he had, he bought a Tonga. And he used to ferry people in the hand Tonga. Rikshawala with pulled the thing and ferried people. And he said, look, I don't think I'll go far pulling Tongas. I can't go far in life. It might earn, help me earn a few rupees. He saved a bit and then took a small shop on rent in Karolbag. I think it's still there, which, which he called, uh, what do we call it? Mahashi on the Hati. That's how the name um, MDH came. It was, and he did all kinds of innovations with uh, spices. I do read about him. I don't want to waste the time in this lecture by telling you all the details. But from a tiny shop in in in, in Karolbag, he rose to become a celebrity. He became, he got awarded by the president. I think in 2015, he was the highest uh, taxpayer in India. Now, who would have thought that somebody who was pulling a Tonga would rise to become the richest person, the one who declared the highest income in India? Sheer sure, hard work, no self pity. He had no shame about carrying, pulling people in Tonga. And he built a shop and built it brick by brick. Today, his family is, is uh, getting rewarded for what he did. And even in his 90s, he used to go to work. I, I don't know whether he's alive right now, but I know he was alive till he was 96. Um, so that is Govindolakia. Uh, two years ago, when I was the president of IMC Chamber of Commerce, which is a big chamber of commerce in India, in Mumbai. I happened to visit Surat and I requested the organizers of the Surat Chamber of Commerce to take me to one particular company for an hour before the actual, before my talk. It is a company called Sri Ramakrishna Exports. The man behind Sri Ramakrishna Exports is a gentleman named Govind Dholakia. His factory in, in Surat looks like a five-star building from outside and inside. It's actually a diamond cutting industry. It's the first LEEDS uh, certified building in India. 
He's got many hospitals, many schools, all kinds of charities he does. I was also introduced to one of the supervisors who has got very special skills. And you know that that supervisor earns 34 crores salary a year. It's not a mistake, three, four crores salary, that supervisor. This man developed management systems to identify talented people. He identified systems to promote people. And he's got people who don't leave him. Amazing systems he has created there. The management systems. He is not an MBA. He was an ordinary worker in a small diamond cutting shop. He learned, he was very skillful. And he said, I want to build a much better diamond cutting factory. He gathered three, four other who were skilled and said, paise loan mein lunga. I'll take a loan, I'll set up a small thing, and together we'll build something great. The other four said, okay, because we know how good you are. And he built the 6,000 crore empire. He's worth 9,000 crores. A man who was a worker in the Surat diamond cutting worker. He had the vision to build this company. His factory is like no other factory I've ever seen. It's like a five-star hotel, I'm telling you. His library there is unbelievable. His, his, uh, his motto is, I am nothing, but I can do anything. And it tells everybody in his, all his workers, say, I am nothing, but I can do anything. And he believes sincerely that he can do anything. But he, he, is anything is he can do anything in terms of uh, becoming rich he can do anything in terms of charity he can do anything in terms of, can do anything in terms of things for society is unbelievable so i've seen this with my own eyes that's why i'm narrating these instances so that you can believe that you may be nothing today but you can become great but if you have to become great you have to combine it with the knowledge that you're going to get at first timer you can't just say i'll work hard you know even all these people have combined knowledge. I'll take you to the next story, which is about a, her mother was a single mother. So she didn't have a father to raise her. In fact, she had three stepfathers as she went along. So everything was designed for her to become a failure. The neighborhood, her, her mother's ability to pay for a good livelihood, nothing was there. No father to guide her. So. Mother worked hard to earn enough to put her in good schools. And when she reached college, she worked hard to get ahead in life in college. She managed to complete a master's in engineering from mechanical engineering from uh, Columbia University. And no one would have imagined that this lady would go on to become, would become anything in life. No never ever imagined she would have got a master's degree ever because of where she lived. No one would have imagined that she would become the chairman or chairperson of Xerox. Xerox is a Fortune 500 company. She rose to become the chairperson of the company. She was a black woman. No black woman had reached the board level of a, of a first of all, getting to the board of a 500 uh, five, Fortune 500 company is almost impossible in the US because it's a male dominated board. She reached there. No black woman could reach even close to the board level. She became the chairman of the board. And she says it's because dreams do come true, but not without the help of others. Good education, strong worth ethic, and the courage to learn. Can you hear? Can you hear? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, she, she's co she, her quote is, do, dreams do come true, but not without the help of others, not without a good education, not without strong work, work ethic, and not without courage. When everything is working against you, you should have the courage to fight and win. Now, these seven people have demonstrated to you how you can start as nobody with no special advantage, in fact, have disadvantages and yet have reached the very top in life. 
figuratively speaking, they have climbed Mount Everest. But talking of Mount Everest, I'm reminded of another story. I promised to tell seven, but Mount Everest brings another story to mind. Uh, have you heard of Arunima Sinha? Has anyone heard of Arunima Sinha? Anyone at all put your hand up? Okay, if no one has heard, she is a Padma Shri winner. Why did she win Padma Shri? She was a seven time Olympic uh, and a seven time national volleyball player. She was also a football player. Can you imagine you're at the national level, you're a football player and a uh, volleyball player? She wanted to join the central, uh, say the CISF, for the job. She didn't come from a great family. And when she was going from Lucknow to Delhi for an interview, she, she was attacked. Can you hear me? Can you hear? Yeah. Can you hear? Okay, so when she was in the train from Lucknow to Delhi, not many years ago, she was attacked by some miscreants. They tried to rape her. She fought hard. Finally, they threw her out of the train. When she fell out of the train, a passing train ran over her legs. So here was the national volleyball champion, a great football player, going for an interview to join the CISF. The CISF would have taken her blindly because she was already famous. But she lost both her legs. What does she do? Doesn't give up. She doesn't. Can you hear me? Okay, so yes, sir. Yes, she doesn't sir. give up. She starts training in mountain climbing, and she became the first handicapped person to climb Mount Everest. We think of Hillary and Tensing, no, okay, but they had legs to train with. Here was a person without legs, handicapped person climbing Mount Everest. That's Arena Masina. Now tell me, what does anybody in your class in in Fostema have as a disadvantage? If these eight people had. So what's to prevent you from winning? If you have noted down some words against each person's story and look at it again tonight, you'll realize that it was a combination of, of hard work, seeking knowledge, determination, humility, perseverance, and integrity that took them there. Is it hard to cultivate that? I don't think so. I don't think it's hard, provided you have a goal, you have a vision that I want to become something. I don't want to spend two years here just waiting for a job to come. I want to make something out of myself. Then you'll succeed. You'll become one in a million. You have a choice of become yet another ordinary MBA. There are thousands of MBAs coming out of the year every year from this world. You are lucky to be at Fostima because, because you have professors who are accomplished, who can give you knowledge, suck the knowledge, take in all of it, <coughs> and try and do something about it. What I'd like you to do is think about it, and if you have any questions, please ask. I'd like to end on this note. I'd be happy if you implement some of these things to learn from all these people and succeed. I won't be alive when you are successful because I'm already in my 70s. But I'll smile from somewhere up there when I see many of you succeeding. So make a promise to yourself that in addition to what you learn at Fostheimer, you will build certain things in yourself to make yourself successful. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions. The first question to me is, now can, um, okay, let me go to the questions. What are the things that click in your mind so successfully, so that you successfully predict the future crisis? Um, it's quite simple. Every year, you, all the while, you got to keep your ear close to the ground. You know, in the olden days, they should find out whether a train is coming by putting their head near the railway track on the railway line. 
and even if the mile, uh, train is miles away, before you hear the first horn from the engine, you can hear that tuk tuk sound in the rail. So you got to keep your ears to the ground and say, what is changing? And if you keep looking at it all the while, you suddenly notice something has changed. Okay, let's take the late, most recent case. What made me realize that there is a huge crisis coming and uh, that the trigger point is here. And from 2018, I've been saying that watch out, things are going to change. Uh, there is a, a, a index called the CAPE index, which measures how overpriced shares are in the US, on the, in the US market. That CAPE index measures the, the, I don't want to get too technical, but what's the price of the shares versus what the earnings are. It's not a simple P by E ratio, a little more complicated. And they found that in the Great Depression, that number had was 25. In 2018, January, it had reached 30. It had not reached even during the 2008 crisis. So that was a signal which told me, look, if it reaches 2000, it has reached 30. It should be around 15, 16, 18, not 30. The chances that something can knock it down is very real. Now, I kept looking for where the trigger is. I couldn't find any trigger in 2018. In 2019, also, I kept watching. There was no trigger. But in December 2000, no, I think 2000, middle of 2000, there were a lot of talk about um, what happened, whether vaccines are being developed for Ebola, for this, for that, and how uh, dangerously placed we are if there's another pandemic. So I said, okay, uh, there is a pandemic danger and there is the CAPE index is too high. And in December, I read, I keep reading a lot. In December, I read that there is a problem in Wuhan, end of December, last week. And it's spreading and that they're closed that city. I said, oh my God, this is a problem. If this is a problem and it's going to hit the spread around the world, then India will be in deep shit. Sorry, using French. So I said, I'm going to write this year's paper titled The Tipping Point. And the first part will be, what should India do so that the trigger doesn't hit us too badly? So if you see trigger, take a, take, uh, the trigger point one, you find that there are lots of things government of India had to do, but the government did nothing, zero. So we, I knew that when I was writing the second part in February, that if it hits India, it's going to hit us very badly. I kept looking at various models and it was certain the way it was spreading to Italy and other places. It's only a question of time before it comes to India. And we're going to have a major crisis. And there was also simultaneously, there was knowledge that there is no medicine, there's no vaccination. What are we going to do? So that's how I figured this out. The 2008 crisis was predicted by uh, when I was in Aberdeen on a holiday with my wife and daughter. The daughter's working in London at that time. We were walking along the road and we had a nice drink and came back to the room quite tired, switched on the radio, uh, TV rather, and they said, Northern Rock Bank has sunk. I said, what? Northern Rock Bank has sunk? It's a very important bank in England. And they said the whole cause is CDS. No, honestly, I'd never heard of CDS. Some of your professors would have heard of CDS at that time in 2007. This is May 10th, 2007. So that night I sat and read about all about CDS and what's happening. And I said, oh my God, there's a crisis coming. It's a global crisis coming. Um, I sold off all my equity over the next two, three months. As I watched this uh, CDS developing, I found that Citibank is getting bankrupt. Goldman Sachs is in trouble. JP Morgan is in trouble. And uh, Morgan Stanley is in trouble. All these three had made huge bets on commodities and they would unravel. Similarly, uh, I saw that CDS 
what's the what's the basis for creating CDS? The basis for creating CDS is was there is the underlying loan was loans given to people who cannot repay loans, and on that loan they consolidated loans and created a new financial product. On that financial product they created another layer. There were twenty layers of products created, and the total speculative outstandings were eight hundred million dollars million dollars which was six times uh, or no it is 480 at that time it was eight times that the total money in circulation it was se several times the gdp of usa so it just took one trigger to knock us market out so then i tried to understand the mathematics behind the cds and i found that two critical assumptions the algorithm were that the price of real estate should not drop and interest rate should not go up. The interest rates had already gone up in 2016 end and 2007, uh, 2006 end and early 2007. In early 2007, real estate prices had already started dropping. The two critical assumptions in the algorithm of the CDS was already broken. So the CDS was going to break fall like a pack of cards. And I saw that two, three of the biggest financial banks in the world had taken huge stakes in speculation. So it has got to crash because the algorithm has already failed. So they, it didn't take any uh, astrology to figure out what's happening. It was just pure math. So I had done a series of lectures between September and November 2007, where I warned people that you're going to see such a crash that the central banks of different countries will not be able to manage it. The presidents and prime ministers will have to get together. And I'll show you the, the presentation. It's still there. I can't change it. <clears throat> and after that, actually what happened was G8, G20 was formed after that. 20 nations get to, got together. Presidents of these countries and finance ministers got together. And they tried to save the world. Once again, no astrology. It was purely keeping the earth to the ground and understanding. In 2008, um, Mr. Professor Cole had said that I predicted that the oil price will crash. Oil price will crash from 140 to below 100, and instead, Goldman Sachs at that day predicted that it will go to 200. I'm saying the opposite. Logic is very simple. <clears throat> In no country, if the price of energy is more than five percent of the GDP of that country, oil can go up to that level and then start going down. Something goes on because it's not sustainable. The demand falls sharply, and if out of the demand of 90 million barrels per day, even two billion barrels come off, there's a disaster. You know why? Because out of all, if a hundred barrels of oil are traded, only 10 barrels are actually bought. 90 barrels are only speculative positions taken. They just take a position, and then on that the day of uh, the, the, spec, the closes. You pay the difference, you either make a loss or a profit, you don't collect them uh, oil. Only 10% is transacted. So if the demand for oil falls by 2 billion barrels per day, it is disaster of oil price. That is how I predicted below 100. I couldn't predict it would go down to 40. I didn't even try because it's a spiral. Okay, I hope I've answered that question. Uh, there are other questions. So as you say, thousands of US companies came from China to India, but their statement to do, from Donald Trump targeting Apple, if any company from China is suited to any other country other than United States, then US will impose some percentage taxes. So would it be a good opportunity for an MBA to get into MBA college? Because if US impose taxes, then companies will avoid to come. Okay. These are two unconnected questions. Is it a good? Opportunity to do MBA? Yes, because if you have learned from the stories of, let's take even one story. What does uh, Ursula Burns tell you? You have to have, your dreams can come true, but not without the help of others. Give and help a lot of other people. Good education, and good education today includes MBA. A bachelor's degree doesn't prepare you for a job market, doesn't prepare you to succeed in business. Whether it is a US company or Indian company, whether you're starting your own business, it doesn't matter. You need that knowledge. 
and you have a strong ethic, work ethic and courage. So you're doing an MBA has nothing to do with what Donald Trump does. But I'll answer the question about First of all, hundreds of US companies did not come to India. We want them to leave China and come to India. But we're not doing enough. There's stiff competition from Vietnam, there's stiff competition from Malaysia, from Thailand, Indonesia, and Eastern Europe. Don't forget Mexico. All these countries are sending the ambassadors to companies, meeting them in the US, meeting the Chinese counterparts. And, uh, they're not meeting the Chinese counterparts in China because that will be a bit of a problem. But they're meeting the headquarters in the US and saying, please come. We haven't done enough of it. We are doing it. We're not done enough of it. Now, Trump has to make sure that when they go, they'll come to India, uh, to USA rather than to India, Vietnam, and China. But what is actually happening? Less than 15% are uh, going back to US. They're going to all these other countries. Now, what we need is to try and see that India is more attractive than that. But it's nothing to do with you're doing your MBA. MBA is for you to succeed. And MBA doesn't mean that you can join a US multinational. There are so many successful people in this country who have not joined US multinationals. Uh, not even one of the people whose stories I told you has joined a multinational. I'm saying, go join a multinational, you learn a lot. But that's not necessarily the passport for success. Okay? So don't worry whether U.S. companies come to India, if they come to India, good. You should also remember that India is a huge market. And everybody wants to sell in the Indian market. When they find that it's cheaper to manufacture in India than to import and sell, they'll start manufacturing in India in due course. We may miss the bus in terms of this huge rush of companies coming to India, but they will come to India because India offers a big market. So don't worry. India will have an opportunity because of the supply chain problem with China. Uh, the next question is, what's the name of the girl, the athlete? Wilma Rudolph, W-I-L-M-A. The surname is Rudolph, R-U-D-O-L-F. There are statues of her built in many places in the US because they never had an athlete done so well in spite of having all these disadvantages. Uh, many of them would have been shocked. The other athlete was uh, Nurima Sinha, who was a volleyball champion, a football champion, and she rose to become the first handicapped person, a woman to climb the Everest. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, somebody said it requires passion to win. Absolutely. How to maintain the craving to achieve the goal? I'll take you back to what Wilma Rudolph's mother said to her. If you really, really want to win, walk, and play like them, you will be able to. So if you really, really want to succeed, you will succeed. Tell yourself, ask yourself what you really want. If you're not serious about succeeding, leave it alone. Eat Golgappas and have fun. But if you want to succeed in life, then I can tell you it's worthwhile succeeding. Like for instance, I've been lucky to make a, a have great friends, great associates, uh, great family, a good bit of money, none of which came all of a sudden, took a lot of years of work, and be able to contribute to certain things which are important for society with my money, it will make you happy. So I would suggest that you examine yourself and say, that you really, really want to do it? If you really, really want to do it, you will succeed. Uh, somebody has wished me well and said, I will be alive when they succeed. I want you to succeed whether I'm alive or not. I told you, I promise to smile at you from up there. I don't think I'm going to live that long. I'm a cancer patient. I'm fighting cancer. I know I'll win for many years. I've already won for five years. I'll win for some more years. I really want to win. Okay? But when you are successful, and don't look for shortcuts at success in success in five years, ten years, I'll be happy we'll succeed 30 years from now. At that time, I look from up and and uh, tap and spine. Um, how can we develop a person, a perfect vision, and which will be fruitful for us? 
Well, um, there are ways, but it'll never be perfect. You'll have, when you walk along the horizon and you see a mountain, you'll see the mountain and say, I want to climb that mountain. When you reach near the top, you'll see another mountain behind, which is even taller, which you couldn't see earlier. You'll readjust your vision to climb that mountain if you're interested in counting mountains. So as you move in life, you'll see many mountains which come up. And if you're looking for challenges, you'll say, ah, here comes another mountain. Incidentally, I've climbed a number of mountains. I've climbed a live volcano in, in, uh, in Indonesia, 6,000 feet above sea level. I climbed with bare hands. And when I went up to the top, I was told by the hotel people that it's a bit crazy. But two of us went together. Uh, I was told that when you come back, you'll never be able, to, you won't be able to hear for one week. You'll be deaf. I didn't take it seriously, but he said, don't get worried. You don't need to go to the doctor. It'll come back to you. So I told my friend, look, this guy says I'll be deaf for, we'll be deaf for a week. He said, let's go. Don't worry. Let's go and climb the mountain. So we climbed that mountain a live volcano with smoke coming up when we reached the top i found that some parts near where you could walk along the top the crater were eight feet wide some parts were two feet wide and where we reached the top was two feet wide before we could walk any further the wind came in our direction and we were covered with gray uh, white smoke sulfur smoke i'm highly allergic to things i started sneezing i find it difficult to breathe but we said we have to be patient. It took 45 minutes of wind for the wind direction to change. And when the direction changed, wow, what a sight it was. Uh, many volcanoes against this dark black sky and the sun rising. It was unbelievable. It was worth it. So you don't worry about your vision. I'm sorry I diverted from the topic. But um, you will see more things which will challenge you as you go along. And all your life, look for challenges and you'll have mountains to climb. Uh, important thing when I consult for companies, I said before we set your goals, set your vision. You need to have a big, hairy goal. Hairy goal means not very clear and big and very ambitious. It should be something you think you cannot achieve. Don't go and settle for small vision. Once you have a vision that you want to do something which is really, really big, be patient. You can't do it in 10 years. You can do it in 30 years. You can do it in 40 years. Some mountains took me 40 years to climb. Be patient. Work hard. You'll get there. Meanwhile, help a lot of people. Other people will help you. That's how you help. You get to climb. You can't climb by yourself. So all the while, keep giving. When you give, you'll, you'll be a getter. And once your vision is there, you can then set to what goals, you know what goals to set if that's your vision. Vision should not be about being flashily dressed or showing off that you got a lot of money. Be humble. Nobody likes show-offs. Just work quietly and do your job. Ah, since this lockdown scenario is going on, how should we utilize this time efficiently? I, can, I cannot tell you what to do. I can only tell you there are exciting things to do. The world has so many opportunities. When you start looking for challenges, you start saying, which challenge should I select? Because there are too many. And when you have too many, you won't have time. You won't get enough time. Today you're saying you've got time. That's because you've got set challenges for yourself. So once you set challenges, you won't have enough time. And what I would also urge you to do is read biographies of people who are successful. It's not about knowing that Mahatma Gandhi did great things or so-and-so did. It is to understand how do they go about it. It will give you the courage. You think they were all great and they were everything was laid out for them. No. Most of the great people who have succeeded have nothing. You are like us, you and me. My father was a government officer. I mean, here uh, among your professors whose uh, parents were government servants, you're not big industrialists. But we read, I read a lot of biographies of people. And then you start saying, oh, wow, you get inspired by them. That's why I thought I'll tell you some inspiring stories so that I trigger the passion for in you for succeeding. I trigger the passion for you to chase these professors and say, 
teach me this. I, I want to understand this. I want to know this. Ask silly questions because silly questions might be actually great. Other people didn't have the guts to ask the question you asked. So you will have no shortage of time. You won't have time at hand if you decide that you want to succeed. You set big challenges and then set goals to achieve those challenges. No problem. And I said in the beginning, you really, really want to succeed, then you'll do it. How much challenge, challenging is it for students of other backgrounds like science and arts to learn and practice management studies? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. In many colleges, a lot of students who come in have engineering. What, has, what do engineers have? They have, it's not that they've learned anything more than you, except two things. They've learned to think logically because they have, they're given uh, the ability to solve problems. And they have the ability to look at data and use it. It's an ability which anybody can have. See, when you, uh, when you say you do science, that's an ability you can get. Think logically. If you are studying economics, it's all about doing things logically. If you're doing law, it's all about logic. So if you understand that the others have no extra ability other than the ability to be logical and analytical, you can also get it. So you're not at a disadvantage just because you did arts or science. There may be a company which is looking for an engineering graduate trainee, but with an MBA, you can't apply for that. But if they're looking for someone in sales, we're looking for sales as I'm in marketing. We're looking for something in HR. You don't need to have sales. Now, as you go up further in the organization, even what you learned, even if you specialize in marketing, marketing is not going to help you reach the top. It's your ability to understand HR, your ability to understand manufacturing, etc. And you learn that. And the persons at the top of the pyramid are people who have got a feel for all. So try and read about various things and not just say, I'm a marketing person, I'm a finance person. If you're a finance person, you'll become a chief accountant at the end of your life. If you're a person who says, I got finance, I can learn a whole lot of other things, go to the top. If you look at the CEOs today, some of them are from manufacturing, some of them are from sales, some of them from um, finance, from various fields. And they didn't teach finance in uh, engineering. They seldom taught economics. In, uh, they didn't teach sales or marketing in, in, in economics, in engineering. So when the market requires you to be able to do sales, marketing, HR, this, that, and the other, the only subject in which they can score over the rest of you who are not in engineering is in production management. All other subjects, you are equal. If you tell yourself, I'm inferior, you'll remain inferior. You'll be scared to fight. If you could start all over again, would you look, do your life differently? Probably no. I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question after telling you something. There's an old Zionist. You know what a Zionist is? Jewish. There's a Hebrew saying, that if everybody everybody complains of problems, if everybody is supposed told you can take off your problem and hang it on a clothesline, you know clothesline is a line on which you wash clothes are hung in the sun. So if you each one is allowed to go and hang their prob problems on the clothesline and step back and say, okay, go and pick up anyone you want. Everybody will go and pick up his own problem and take it back. Okay, so. I'm telling you, for that and for other good reasons, I would do exactly the same. Because what I did at every stage of my life has helped me, helped me achieve my goals. My vision was set, reset several times and I've achieved the new goals. And every bit of thing I did at every stage has helped me going along. So I don't see any reason why I should do, follow a different path. I might go faster or slower. Tactics might change. The journey would, I would 
probably choose the same. Maybe I'm stupid. Um, how can I stand different from the crowd? That's a lovely question. Uh, Raj, let this be the last question you answer. Okay. The, okay. the rest of them you can. Hey, okay. You can answer later, maybe yeah. through mail or something. Okay. So, have you heard of the concept of purple cow? If anybody has heard of the concept of purple cow, put your hand up. Nobody? Okay. Now, there is. Uh, marketing come management guru who became famous only in the last 10 12 years in the us his name is set godin s e t h g o d i n he introduced this concept of purple cow what's a purple cow supposing you're going on a road in a car with friends and you see a few cows grazing you see the cow and just keep going supposing among a whole lot of cows you saw one cow looking purple, you say, hey, purple cow, purple cow, everybody say purple cow. Why? Because a purple cow is worth remarking. You know, there's a word called remarkable. He says the meaning of the word remarkable means worth making a remark about. Remarkable doesn't mean great. Remarkable means having worth making a remark about. So if you make yourself remarkable, Think of, think of the 10 different things that you could be doing differently from the others and which will have an impact on people and choose the one which will have the highest impact and suddenly you'll be a purple cow. Think about the purple cow, keep it in your mind and you will find your purple cow moment if you're serious about it. So all good things have to end. I enjoyed this. I'm sorry I have to stop. Thank you very much for being patient. I promised not to talk for more than 45 minutes. I did that. And now we've had a little bit of an extended uh, Q&A, but that also has to end. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to all of you. I enjoyed it. But if you want to say thank you to me, please decide to succeed and let me get a chance to wave at you from up there when you succeed. Thank you.